This is from a short story called Tiny Ghosts. So I was sitting in the bath when the tiny ghosts started showing up, and I'm not going to tell you anything too specific about my bath because I don't believe in pornography. Because right away you're thinking it's bubbly and sexy and ooh la la, but that's not the kind of bath I take. I take oatmeal baths. You can buy the oatmeal bath packets from Walmart for $4.99 on sale. They come in a box of eight, and Walmart's all that's around for shopping. So I take an oatmeal bath with Epsom salts for my arthritis, and the, color is, the water is the color of street slush in the winter. Little blobs of oatmeal float around sometimes, and I smush them in my fingers. It's weirdly satisfying, and I don't mind mentioning it. I take my baths in the upstairs bathroom, which is not attached to the bedroom since it's an older house. I light a candle that smells like peach pie. I pour myself a cup of wine. I don't like wine glasses, too delicate, so it's just in a cup, which is good enough for me. We buy Sutter Home White Zinfandel, which is $3.50 a bottle. In town, we can get it from CVS for $4.99. That's why we really do have to drive out to the Walmart. It's like that with everything. I like my bath water really hot, as hot as I can get it to go. I have my bath copy of Jane Eyre. The good copy is a hardcover, and this one's a fat paperback. It's got warbly pages from the bathwater. I never start at the beginning of it anymore, not particularly. Usually I just flip to any spot I feel like reading. It's a very complicated book, and I'm proud to say I've read it many times, because I'm a good reader. My bath is comfortable, and the room looks nice because I have a very nice house, and I can't help but notice for a second that things are perfect. You know, you have to work hard all the time just to get things perfect for even a second. It's very satisfying to be me. Well, I'm only about halfway through my bath night when my husband Gary gets home. This is still before the tiny ghost now, and I hear him come upstairs, and he just comes in like he does. He opens the door, and I pop straight up in the bath, and he comes over and kisses me on top of my head. He has to bend all the way over to do it, and then we start to talk. Hey, hey, how was your night? Good. Yours? Well, it's still going on. I have wrinkled hands always, but especially now from the bath water, so I reach over for some wine. And he says, mind if I pee? And I say, yeah, sure. And I pull back the shower curtain while I take a sip so that he has his privacy. You're reading Jane Eyre again, Gary asks. It's my favorite, I tell him. Huh, he says. I was just talking to Pete. Now he's a guy who really knows how to read. Reads a book a week. Big ones, too. Very impressive. Now, it's pretty nice with the curtain pulled. Dark. It's like a tiny room that's all bath, which is an idea I don't mind saying I like. I picture myself in the tiny room, and I wonder how I'd get into it. Probably a tiny door. Tiny door? Sure, a tiny door. And then I see myself very tiny, and I get in through the tiny door, and I dive right into the bath. Gary flushes. He washes his hands. He pulls back the shower curtain, and then I'm my real size again. He picks up my book. Pete should read Jane Eyre, I say, because it's a great book. Anyone would like it. But guess what my husband says? Nah, he only likes new books, hip ones. Jane Eyre is a hip book. Oh, I know that. Gary blushes, and now, of course, he's backtracking. That's not what I meant. I meant, like, whatever the newest book is on the new book list. So I say, hmm, which is what I think of that. And I say, you know, I'm trying to enjoy my bath. Gary comes over and kisses me on the head again. OK, you know I didn't mean that about your book. I'm sure Pete would like it a lot. And then he leaves, and he didn't mean it, but he made me feel like an old fuddy-duddy, sitting in the fuddy-duddy bath with my fuddy-duddy bath book. And that's when the tiny ghosts start showing up. First, a tiny door opens up. The tiny door's in the corner by my feet where the tub meets the wall, and there's a tiny ledge. It's not like a fancy door, just a regular brown door with a knob. And a little person walks out, and he just stands there. He's kind of clear like a shadow, and he's wearing cargo shorts, flip-flops, and a t-shirt, maybe the size of my hand. He has tiny black hair and a tiny beard. He's carrying a tiny towel. Of course, I pull my feet back fast, which splashes. I cover up my chest area with my knees. I think I'm probably imagining things, but I'm a pretty steady person, and it isn't like me to imagine this hard. And he talks to me. Oh, hey, he holds up one hand. He's waving. He looks around. Hey, I say. I'm holding my two knees tight. What are you doing here, he asks, like I'm interfering with his night and not the other way around. So I go, taking a bath? He doesn't say anything, just puts his hands in his pockets and nods. OK, he says, and turns back to the door. Wait, what are you doing here? I ask, pretty quick, since I want to know, and I think he's leaving. I thought I'd take a bath. Didn't know you were still using the tub. I'm sorry, what? Bath, he says slowly, like I'm stupid. And he makes a circle with his hand, indicating the tub I'm sitting in. 
But it's no problem, he says. I'll come back later. What? See ya. I talk fast. I'm sorry, I say, and I hesitate at what I should call him. Mister? Sir? Little guy? So I go with, I'm sorry, you there. You're a, not to be rude, but what are you? Ghost. A tiny ghost? No, a big one, asshole. <laughs> Excuse me? Kate, bye, he waves again and goes out the tiny door, and I'm alone again. Wait, what? I lean over and open the tiny door, which is still there, but the ghost is gone. I'm all thumbs because the doorknob is so tiny, and for a second, I think that maybe my hand will go right through it if it's a ghost door after all, but no. I open it just fine, and I have to lean all the way over to peek inside. All there is is a long, black, tiny hallway. It's cold in there. I can feel a little chill coming out. So, I sh of course, I shut the little door and get my butt out of that bath. I wrap myself in two big towels. One is a dress, and the other I twist my hair up in, but kind of crazy since I'm shaking all over. I flip on the light switch. I blow out the peach pie candle, and Gary is what I start yelling. He's yelling, too. Hey, hey, yo, look out, Angie. Where are you at? I hear his footsteps coming toward the bathroom. I open the door, and we almost smack right into each other. We're going so fast. Honey, he says, I think I'm hallucinating something. And then we both start babbling and waving our hands and we're saying the same thing. Gary's going on and on about a tiny door and a tiny ghost too. So we sit up all night together, right in the middle of the bed. We can't fall asleep. We don't even try to talk to each other. We just sit and stare out in different directions. Soon we're laying down, but it's laying down like a couple of kittens. In the middle of the bed, all curled up around each other. At about two o'clock, I get hungry. I don't put my feet on the floor because I'm afraid a tiny ghost is going to scurry out. I bend down by my nightstand and open the bottom drawer on it. I keep a box of saltines there. Don't drop any crumbs, Gary says. Huh? He shakes my saltine box. Crumbs will just attract them. <laughs> like with mice? He shrugs, and I have to admit, in my mind it's like we have mice instead of tiny ghosts too. Then again, maybe the saltines do attract them, I don't know, because a tiny door opens in the bedroom, right above Gary's dresser a little brown door, and out come six, six tiny ghosts. It's a tiny ghost gang. They're mostly women ghosts, but there's a couple men in the group too. They're loud like teenagers, laughing and slapping each other on the back. They say things like, is this the place? Yeah, oh my God, this room is ugly as hell. <laughs> now, our bedroom is not ugly as hell, to give you some idea of how wrong these tiny ghosts are. Our bedroom is actually very nice, with fl flower wallpaper and a matching flower bedspread that I found on sale. Gary loops his arms around my waist tight, like we're about to jump off a plane together. He whispers, that's the ghost I told you about, meaning one of the ghosts that just walked in. Which one? The noisy one. Well, they're all noisy at first, so I don't know what he's talking about until the really noisy one speaks up. She talks right to my husband like she knows him. Hey, Gary, she waves, elbowing one of the ghosts next to her. She has long black hair that's full of waves and little braids. She's wearing jeans and a black leather jacket. Is this your special lady? She points to me. Gary squeezes me so tight it hurts. This is my wife. The noisy ghost laughs. Then I guess she's the one responsible for this lousy wallpaper. Lousy, I say, my mouth dropping open, but she's laughing. Hey, Gary, what's your lady's name? But I answer, not him, because I'm pretty mad at her for insulting my nice bedroom. So I say, I'm Angie. She loves it. She cracks up at that, like my name is a joke I wouldn't understand. Classic, she says. Why, I say, what's your name? And she spreads her arms wide like she's asking for a hug. I'm Mystica. Hmm, I say, doesn't sound like you're in much of a position to be making fun of names then. Then Mystica does something that really freaks us out. She jumps to the bed. I mean, she jumps, practically flies. Of course, I shriek, and I climb right over my husband, and I duck behind him like he's a shield. Gary's a good man. He holds out an arm to protect me and sticks his chin out. I didn't know you could do that, I say. I didn't know she could do that. Listen, Mystica says, stepping closer to us, pointing at us with her arms straight out in front of her. I own this house now. These are my friends, and I'm in charge. You don't want to mess with me. When she sees that we're scared, and of course we are, she smiles and flies back to the dresser. And it's so weird when she does it. She stays facing us, flying backwards, like she's being sucked back into the door. Let's get out of here, she says to her friends, and they file out the tiny brown door behind her. Thank you.
That was a great reading. Thank you so much. And it goes on from there. Uh, and I think, well, you all know Audrey, so I don't have to say anything else about you. <laughs> You're here for her. Uh, but this, it, it was so great to start with that reading because, first of all, it's the most recent of all the stories in this book. And I think there are, oh my gosh, 16 stories that span 170 years. And this book was where Amy's story is first published. And you actually, as I understand it, went to a reading, didn't know her, heard her read this story, and then whammo, it gets into this book. Yes, we were at the bookseller and uh and as you just heard, Amy is a fabulous reader, and that's a fabulous story. And uh, we're being cruel because we're going to make you get the book if you want to know what happens. There's, it's not on the internet. You're not going to be able to just go find it somewhere besides the book. Um, but yeah, I heard that, and I was in the process of editing this collection of ghost stories, and I just, I was just like, I want it, I want it. So, and now here it is, and the book is published, and it's in the book. And it's great. Some of the other writers in the book are people like Edgar Allan Poe and Edith Wharton and Ray Bradbury, so you're in good company and, you know, welcome to the club. <laughs> and, well, the, one of the things that I thought is startling about that and wonderful because it, it's got such a snarky contemporary undertone, but that there's a number of very contemporary pieces in the book and you like Neil Gaiman and, and, oh, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them that are all post 2000 five, including your own. And I think most of us tend to think of ghost stories as old things, Edgar Allan Poe, who you start with. The idea of there being contemporary written ghost stories has seemed like sort of an anachronism to me, particularly in our culture where there's like so much ghost stuff going on in TV and in movies that the role that these play now in society, has it changed because we're inured to ghosts? I'm not sure we really are inured to ghosts. I mean, we might be a bit tired of vampires and I think zombies have kind of had it, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, everybody loves The Walking Dead, but I personally am a bit bored with zombies. But I think ghosts are a little bit different. I think ghosts are more, they're, they're sort of like a blue chip stock or something. It's always good, you can always <laughs> go with it. Um, I think ghosts mean something different. Um, they're not quite the same thing as monsters. And especially because ghosts frequently are the ghosts of someone we know. I mean, the thing that's resonant about them is that they're, they haunt us. And they're about longing and loss. And, you know, I, in this collection, I've opted for very domestic ghost stories. Um, my editors and I had a kind of code between us for the type of stories we were looking for, and the code was houses, lovers, children, cats. <laughs> and all the stories somehow involve those. With one artwork, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, but so what did you avoid that you think uh, could have been in here, but you negotiated it away? There's a type of ghost story that's genuinely frightening, and you read it, and then you have to like stay up all night and have the lights on. That's not this book. Um, I, I, won't, I won't even pretend that I'm even trying to scare you with these stories, really. Um, the stories are, are sort of more complicated than that. I mean, everybody's shooting for something a little bigger than just boo. And um, what I was looking for was, was an intensity of emotion and this, this powerful feeling of grief or, you know, a sense that you haven't maybe lived your life correctly. That's what my own story is about. It's about this woman who, uh, she makes a friend and the friend dies and leaves her her house. And the house turns out to be full of phantom cats. And it's kind of a, a twist on that thing that, I don't know about the men, but all the women I know are a little bit afraid that they're gonna turn into crazy cat ladies. <laughs> um, and so this is kind of a riff on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's Secret Life with Cats, which is the, uh, the second one in the book. And uh, cats have played such an important role in your life. It's kind of makes sense that you would have these ghost cats. And um, I think it was in The Adventurous where a cat, Maurice, is actually born from this lady who then becomes a ghost. And a lot of your work has ghosts and cats. That was kind of like, if there was a third thing, it would be a trifecta of ghosts and cats and whatever else, kind of weird eccentric stories. But you once said, 
that cats are like ghosts. Be nice to them. How, how do you mean that? <laughs> how are they like ghosts? Um, I don't know about other people's cats, but I have two cats. They're both black, and they're very quiet cats. Um, I have Whimsy and Claudine are their names, and Claudine in particular has this habit of standing behind me, like almost touching me, but not quite, and she's so quiet that I don't know she's there. And then, for whatever reason, I will take a step and nearly trip <laughs> backwards over her. She's about killed me. I cannot tell you how many times. Is she trying to kill you? No, Is no, that no. why you want to be nice to she's, her? She's just trying to kind of be close, you know? But, but she's, she just is incredibly stealthy about it. So, um, yeah, they, but they make, they make the house feel different. You know, the house, the house feels like it has living presences in it. But not quite actually real and of this world, I presume. Well, the cats are. I don't know about... Uh, well, know. but if they're like ghosts... Still, how are they like ghosts? Yeah, just just the they sort of animate the space. I see. In, in, a, a, in a way, ghostly way, different from the space without cats in it, huh? And presumably without ghosts. I I'm such a skeptic about the ghost thing. I mean, I love I the idea, but she yeah. does not believe in ghosts. She's never had a ghost thing happen to her. But we're gonna. But you've had people approach you about ghost things, and. I can see why if people didn't know that, and it's one of the first things that people ask you when I've read interviews about this is, do you believe in them? What happened to you? Because so much, almost all of your work, your written work, um, well, and then the, the two sort of novels in pictures that you did have ghosts in them. And even, you know, well, certainly the, um, the Her Fearful Symmetry, uh, The Adventurous, Three Incestuous Sisters, Ghost, 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 Ghost. And then I was thinking about what you say about ghosts and the longing and the loss and the grief. And I realized that Time Traveler's Wife didn't have ghosts in it, but it, it was about those same things. So ghosts have played an important role for you, even though you don't believe in them. Yes. <laughs> um, for a while, I wasn't, I wasn't really aware that I was using a lot of ghosts. Um, nor was I particularly aware that I was constantly making things that were one way or another about loss. Um, I actually had that pointed out to me one day by an audience member. <laughs> I was doing one of these um, you know, events with a Q&A and somebody put up their hand and said, well, why are all your works about loss? And I said, uh, oh, and, and realized in that moment that in fact she had a point um, and had to go home and think <laughs> about it. But it does, it does seem to be the thing that runs through most of the work. And with your sisters and parents here, they might be interested to know. Whatever you did raising her, you know, she came out really interesting, but there's some lost thing going on. Anyway, I don't want to get into your family dynamic. But <laughs> uh -oh. I haven't lost any of them. No. Well, I've been in enough therapy that I could give you some hints about it, but I won't. We can talk about that later. Uh, but I do think that uh, the range that you included in this book uh, we do tend to assume, again, that the typical ghost story is either really scary or very creepy and not contemporary, not ironic, all of those things. But the range of what you've chosen in this book really runs the gamut. I mean, there's nothing terrifying but very creepy, very traditional, but humorous. The P.G. Wodehouse one is just a riot, and which you don't really expect. Um, some, like the mezzotint, very matter-of-fact, practical, like, oh, it's haunted, hmm. And then there are the ones that are just heartbreaking. A.S. Byatt, who you would never, I had no idea she would, she would write a ghost story. And reading, I mean, it, it was heartbreaking anyway, but reading your caption before that, I mean, even now, it just makes me want to cry. Can you describe that? Um, the story of A.S. Bites in this collection is called The July Ghost, and um, the story is about, it's, it's being told by a man who's at a party, and he's talking to a woman he's met, and he's saying something to the effect of, I think I need to move out of the place I'm living in, and she says, oh, why? And he's got this sort of landlady situation, because um, Essentially what's happened is he has moved into this um, room in a house and the woman whose house it is isn't 
particularly warm and fuzzy. She's just, you know, kind of a little bit guarded and standoffish. And he starts um, hanging out outside in the back garden. This is in London. And he's constantly seeing this kid, this boy who's about 10 or 11. And um, there's nothing odd about the kid. The kid is just a kid. And he imagines that this must be a kid of the neighborhood somehow, that the kid is just, you know, coming around because he's local. Um, he mentions the kid casually to the landlady who gets a little freaked out. And gradually it is <clears throat> kind of uh, made clear that, that this is the ghost of her little boy. Um, and I won't tell you what happens then because, you know, spoilers. But um, as I was researching the story, I discovered that it was written about a year after A.S. Byatt's own son, whose name was Charles, uh, was hit by a car and killed. So the, the, the story, I certainly don't think it's any kind of memoir, but the story is powerfully informed by bereavement. Um, there's one other story in the collection that's also by an author who lost a child, and that would be a story called They, which is by uh, Richard Kipling. And that story is, it starts off astonishingly kind of lovely and cheery and sunny, and then when you finally realize in the last couple of paragraphs what is going on, it just becomes kind of heartbreaking. And again, somebody who you wouldn't necessarily you know, associate with a ghost story. And, and it's clear from all of the writers in here that, that writing a ghost story means something very different, I think, and specific than writing you know, in, in uh, Babel Tower or uh, any of the other books and stories that we associate with particular authors. That was a reference to A.S. Byatt. But um, why, what is it about these stories that, that authors keep coming back to? Well, one thing about the ghost story is that um, it didn't used to be sort of fenced off. I mean, it wasn't thought of, I think, as so much of a separate genre. I mean, there are ghost stories in the Bible. There are ghost stories in Tale of Genji. Um, the ghost stories go back thousands of years, pretty much to the beginning of literature. And people who we think of as highfalutin literary writers, like Henry James, quite happily wrote ghost stories. I mean, Turn of the Screw is one of the greats. Um, Toni Morrison, um, Charles Dickens, I mean, everybody just dives right in there because the ghost story offers all these opportunities to a writer. Um, once you introduce something that's outside normal reality, it gives you a chance to observe and comment on that reality and to make, you, you can put characters in a different proximity to each other. Um, for example, there's a couple of stories by Saki in the collection. And you two, would know, yeah. Yeah, they were so short, we just had to have two. Um, but one of them, uh, which is called Laura, when you first read it, you're like, haha, a bit of a joke. But on the other hand, um, what happens in that story is that uh, two characters, um, Amanda and Laura, are talking at the beginning. And Laura's been given a few days to live. And Amanda's like, oh, no, that's so terrible. And Laura's like, oh, that's OK. I'm going to come back as an otter. And, you know, and she does. <laughs> But <laughs> the, the underlying... A really mean otter. <laughs> yeah, a really mean otter. But um, the, the underlying power of that story lies in the departure from the ordinary, and especially in a Saki story where everybody is so uptight and the manners are so tightly wound, you know, this, this chaos that's introduced into this orderly world makes everything suddenly just you know, torque a little bit, and all of a sudden you see these manners and for the craziness that they are. So it's actually probably pretty fun and uh, liberating in a way. For I can see, that's interesting. Um, but so when you, when you curated this collection, were, I, I have to assume there could have been, I don't know, maybe another 20 that you could have chosen, but were you looking specifically for stories that illustrated different kind of approaches to the ghost story. You wanted there not just to be, okay, we need a house, a lover, a kid, a whatever, but I want there to be humor. I want there to be creepiness. I want there to be irony, all of those things. Yes, my one of my main things I was looking to 
Keep Out was the kind of uh, Lovecraftian kind of story where it's, you know, it's like, oh my God, there's a lost civilization in the basement. <laughs> it's like, no, maybe not. Um, so part of what I was looking for was, was range, but also I, I have particular tastes and the things that satisfy me are usually things that are, they have a very dry sense of humor and um, I also like things that work on several levels. Um, if Turn of the Screw was not as long as it is, I would happily have put that in, but it would have taken up half the book. Um, but there is a story in there called The Beckoning Fair One that manages to pull that same trick where you can read it two different ways. You know, either, either there's a ghost or our hero is crazy. And so, you know, things like that where there's complicated Turn of the reading. Screw is very much like that. You yeah. know, people just argued and argued over, you know, what's really going on here. Um, well, uh, one that you particularly love, and I can imagine this was one of the first you wanted in the book, and it's a great story, is the mezzotint, which you apparently read to your class, and it's meant to be read, which I thought was interesting, because I never think of stories as, like, what's the difference between a ghost story that's meant to be read aloud, or just, you know, read as you're about to go to sleep? That's a good question. I mean, one of my favorite things when I was younger was radio mystery theater. Oh my gosh. Did you guys yeah. like that? Uh huh. Yeah. That was just the best. Lying in bed and you're listening to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've always enjoyed that aspect of, of the ghost story in particular because it is, in some ways, an oral tradition. You know, gather around the fire and I'll tell you about this creepy thing that happened to me. You know, you just want to hear, it's, it's very compulsive. You really want to know what happened next. And, you know, there's, there's tricks that, that are very satisfying when somebody pulls them on you, even though you know what the tricks are and you know that they're going to happen, but you can't see them coming. And, yeah, it's just a nice thing. I mean, not all of these stories are, are going to be perfect for reading out loud. Um, some of them are too long. Some of them are... I tried reading the Poe story um, a couple weeks ago out loud, and it's it's amazingly complex to speak it. Really, it has it has a very the sentence structures the sentences go on and on and and there's a kind of baroque quality to the language that's uh, interesting to try to wrap your tongue around. One of the things I loved about the mezzotint too is that it's a haunted object, and that we don't get so much except stupid things like my mother the car i just thought of that remember it's like <laughs> the worst thing ever your car is the spirit of your mom Oy. Um, talk about sense of loss get rid of that car but uh your your drawing for that we have to get back to the drawing the fact that you not only were the curator of this collection but the illustrator of it and because so much, like I can't separate your writing from your illustration, from your artwork. It's all just part of this whole thing. But with the exception of a drawing that you did very recently, the New York Times, an illustration for a review of Elizabeth Berg, I can't think of, and I could be wrong, anything you've illustrated that wasn't your own. Like you were called upon to make illustrations for other people's work. And I, have to wonder about that process. It is interesting. I mean, when I was when I was a kid, I thought I might grow up to be a book illustrator. That seemed like a really great thing yeah, to do. Yeah, Batman and Robin, your first drawing. I don't know. How'd you get to that? <laughs> well, I, was, I was like three when I did that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I mean, illustration is, is a really interesting art form. It's funny because if you're an art student and somebody says your work is illustrative, you hide your head in shame and go, oh no, and you have to like, you know, you, you have to do something about it. But I mean, really illustration is much more interesting than the word illustrative because when we say something's illustrative, we just mean it's kind of literal. But really good illustration takes the piece that it's supposed to go with and it extends it, it comments on it, it kind of spins it and, and kind of amplifies parts of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was trying to do with these stories, was to, to kind of um, give them a little push in one way or another, just kind of extrapolate something from them. Was it hard? Was it harder to do it for somebody else's work than from your own? For instance, I know that uh, 
it's probably the adventurous. It started out as an actual story that then was taken over by the, the pictures that you drew, the drawings. And so that became, that was leading the text basically, which is sort of like Edward Gorey, I think of him. Like it's, you see the picture and then you read, you know, and that only complicates it sort of further. Was how does choosing to uh, somehow to illustrate somebody else's story, I guess I'm asking, is it harder or is it just is the same process? I don't think it's harder, but you really have to sit with the story for a while. You have to read it several times and kind of go off and you know let it do something to you. Um, I think that it's it's much better to illustrate something that feels close somehow. the The harder stories to illustrate are the ones for me anyway that that I don't feel quite as connected to. Um, some of the illustrations were a bit more obvious than others. Like after I had illustrated the Ray Bradbury story, um, which is There Will Come Soft Rains, uh, Ken Gurley, my assistant, was uh, Google imaging the story for some reason and discovered that everybody who's ever illustrated ever has come up with more or less the same image. <laughs> At which point I was like, well, okay, whatever, we'll just roll with it. Um, I decided not to start over again, but. It's, it's a funny thing because obviously all the illustrators are, are honing in on this one thing that speaks to us. Um, the hardest one to illustrate was actually the, the Neil Gaiman story because if you don't watch it, you can do massive spoilers on that story. Click, clack. Click, clack, the rattle bag, yeah. The rattle bag. Yeah, the story's short, and if you go for the really great visual, you will give away the ending. Right, right. Now, what about the idea that it, some of these are kind of predictable, like you know pretty much ahead of time what's going to happen. Does that matter at all? Do you care? Do you think that they have to be, there has to be a kind of like, you know, with some of these there has to be a surprise? It's nice if there's a surprise, but sometimes it's nicer if the story, like as readers we've all been trained that a story has a certain shape. And if, if the author, for whatever reason, doesn't do that shape, we feel a little odd about it. Um, some of my students and I, we, we kind of scornfully refer to something as a New Yorker story if it doesn't have a good ending. <laughs> do you guys find this? New Yorker stories, shaky endings? Um, it seems very fashionable lately to have that ambiguous ending where it just kind of stops and you turn the page and you're like, where's the rest of it? <laughs> so, you know, to me that's kind of, an example of things that are not finishing that shape. They don't, they don't do that thing that we feel a story ought to do. Um, I mean, sometimes I suppose that could work really well, but it's a hard thing to do. And in these stories, some of them really do go ba -doom, boom, you know, it's, it, they, they do it a bit predictably. Um, sometimes it's just a story that we're so familiar with that, that it's, it's the prototype for a million other stories exactly. like it and that's why we think it's predictable. But in the case of the Edgar Allan Poe story, it's like, no, it was ahead of all those other things. That's the, you have to put it into those contexts, I think, also. Yeah, that's why I give the publication dates for all the stories, so yeah. people could, because I'm not giving them in chronological order. Right. Okay. And that was interesting, like, how did you decide, like, you had Edgar Allan Poe, and then your story came after that, and they do sort of skip around in terms of time, and. I don't know, I think of it as like arranging your shoes. You, you want all the black ones together, you want all the high heels together. How, do you, how did you decide where to put the story? Well, it's like making a mixtape. Boy, does that date me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a mix CD, a mix, a mix whatever high fidelity. we call them now, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's about the running order and it's about the experience of, okay, this, then that, you know, like, like in my mind, it's interesting. It's more interesting to read my story after reading the Poe story, not because I'm trying to compare myself to Poe, but because the two stories both feature cats very heavily, but in entirely different ways. And one story is very masculine, and the other is very feminine. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking for things that are, are in conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. um, also, I knew that I wanted the Ray Bradbury story at the very end. Um, that made sense, actually. Yeah. Because it is sort of the end. Well, it takes place, it's supposed to be taking place in the year 2026, so 
in terms of when the story is taking place, it should be at the end. It's, it's the one in the future. But also, um, what happens in that story is it's about a mechanical house that has survived um, some kind of um, nuclear Armageddon. I mean, everything else has been destroyed. And um, the house is just standing there quietly making toast and trying to wake up everybody and, you know. Get them off to school. The house <laughs> keeps talking to these occupants that are no longer there to be talked to. And it's, it, it really is the ghost in the machine or the machine in the ghost. And, and not written as a ghost story even, but when you put it next to a bunch of ghost stories, it does a different thing. Yeah, it made a lot of sense. It's kind of also really sad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so you don't believe in ghosts, and yet after uh, her, fear, uh, her fear, fearful symmetry, you said that you were inundated by fans, readers, who came up and wanted to share with you their own ghost stories. Tell us one or two of those so we can be, you know, scared about something before we leave here. Today. <laughs> um, for the most part, these stories, which were mostly relayed, you know, by people standing in front of me with books to sign, so they had to be short, um, but a lot of people were trying to tell me about experiences that, that they'd had with... Um, the most common experience, as far as I can tell, is that you are sleeping and you are by yourself or, you know, with your partner, and someone comes and sits on your bed. Oh. That seems to be the A number one haunted experience that people have. That's it? God, that's, that's it. a letdown. <laughs> yeah, I know. Whoa. Uh, Huh, okay. <laughs> well, if that happened to you, you might be a little weirded out. Yeah, I'd be weirded out, but it's not, you know, like, boo, chains. No, but I don't... If, allowing that there are real ghosts, I think a lot of the stories, a lot of the things that happen are just kind of simple and elegant, and, and the thing that people seem to take away from it is a feeling of happiness that there's some kind of presence or contact um, nobody, nobody's telling me like hitchhiker Mary type stories. Right, right. Well, that's I, good. Yeah, I guess, yeah. You know, there, I was reading that in all of these ancient cultures, almost all of them, um, and maybe even today in China and certain in India, certain places, that the presence of a ghost wasn't interpreted as something necessarily scary, but that we had to do something to get that ghost. That something was wrong that a problem needed to be solved. It wasn't like, oh God, it's, it's like, oh, what can we do? How can I help you? Yeah. I thought that was a healthy approach. Yeah, there's a whole strain of thinking about ghosts where the ghosts are almost like stranded travelers who need some kind of AAA, you know? <laughs> Uber. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Like, like there's something that hasn't been done. There's, there's, a, there's, there's business that isn't concluded and, and has to be laid somehow. We're just too creeped out by them to actually help them out. Be their AAA, like change their tire. We're just more, let's just drive off this highway and get away from here. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a story that I thought about including but didn't because it is so heavily anthologized, which is the Canterbury Ghost by Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. And in that one, um, a family moves into this um, rather old house that has a resident ghost. And at the beginning of the story, the ghost is gearing up. He's really gonna get him, boy, he's gonna haunt him. And the children of the family turn around and start playing pranks on him and like make him miserable. <laughs> and, and finally the daughter of the family says that she'll help him and she, she you know, does what needs to be done in order to get him squared away. Well, like Beetlejuice, which is one of the great like ghost bits, yeah. is great. Um, oh, well, we're gonna have questions in a minute, but I, I really have to um, get a little personal for a minute away from ghosts and into you know, real life, and that is um, that you are, how do you pronounce it, a fianced now? You have, you have a fiancé um, who's kind of a time traveler thing too because he lives in a totally different continent. But, yeah. you know, congratulations. Oh, thanks. And you talk about <laughs> Eddie Campbell. He's I, really sure. cute too. I read them like, <laughs> is he I'll hot? Tell you said so. <laughs> He's really hot. He's got great hair. Just, you guys are gonna be a great couple. Thank you. Um, no, it's it's true. We You're are kind of blushing. I know. That is great. <laughs> I I'm not really used to talking about this. It's kind of an odd thing. I um, was just so happy for you. Well, thanks. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. He's a comics artist, and um, 
We're, we're about to collaborate on a book. Um, he's, we're going to take short stories that I've written, and he's going to make them into comics. So that's kind of fun. There's a cute collaboration that The Guardian, I think, that's, That was what got this rolling. We, we did a short story. Um, it, it was kind of like a little romance story. It's darling. You have to just Google whoever, Audrey Niffenegger. Yeah, it's, the title is Beyonce. not very memorable. <laughs> well, that will get you nowhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wikipedia doesn't even know we're engaged. Um, yeah, the, the title of the story is um, Thursdays, 6 to 8 p.m. It's it, a great story. And, I mean, the woman, it, 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 she's got red hair, and he does propose to her. I don't know if <laughs> how much of that is about you two, but, it, you know. Yeah, no, the, the story happened long before we decided we were going to get married. Um, the story is actually about a couple named um, Ellen and Charles. And um, at the beginning of the story, Charles is proposing to Ellen and he says, but wait, because she's all ready to like, you know, say yes. And he says, but before you say yes, um, once we're married and we're living together, uh, I need two hours every Thursday evening by myself in our place, just alone. And she's like, okay, sure, whatever. And, you know, they get married. And then when she has to actually give him these two hours every week. She starts sitting in coffee shops and going to movies and, and just, of course, it's driving her insane. What does he do by himself for two hours every week? And um, so she goes to these um, spies and she hires spies to find out what he does. And of course- Don't give it away. I'm not going to, but the, uh, all the trouble stems from her curiosity rather than his desire for privacy. <laughs> Isn't there, like a, isn't there like a biblical story about that? You know, well, whatever. I don't want to get into it. Because um, I have other things I want to ask. Well, first of all, just answer me this. How do you, I mean, long distance relationship to me is New York to Chicago or LA if you're really stretching it. But Australia's kind of, you know, even that's a lot for Skype. The time zone alone. Yeah, well, we've conquered Australia. We got rid of the whole Southern Hemisphere. Oh. Um, he has left Australia and is living in London, and we, we have a flat that we share in London. So Great. So we're, uh, typically we're six hours apart rather than 15 or 16 hours apart, which is so, it was, Australia was strange. He was living in Brisbane, and on New Year's, for example, um, we would be in separate hemispheres and separate years for 15 hours. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, just, it was a really long, long way away. I'm glad you're closer now, and maybe yeah. it sounds like you're kind of inching forward. Next is going to be in the middle of the Atlantic, and then maybe you'll get to be in the same country. Well, we've, we've applied for the visa that would let us do that, so, oh. you know. Okay, good. So if, if the government thinks he's okay, then, you know. They just have to look <laughs> at his hair. Okay, nobody's probably as interested in that as I am, but I could just keep going on in this Yeah, vein. somebody, somebody asked a question about ghosts. Right. <laughs> okay. It's too weird talking about my... I have a... Well, I'm sorry, but I, I just had to. <laughs> It was just so cute. Um, you are in the midst of working on the sequel to Time Traveler's Wife. Yes, this is true. Oh, yeah. Mm. When is that coming out? How far along? Uh, well, the, the deadline is July 18th, 2018, for me to turn in the manuscript. So that's a long time from now. So nobody should like sit around holding don't, breath. Yeah, don't make room in your in your on your yeah. shelf just yet. Yeah, no, it'll, it'll creep on, up on everybody just when they've totally forgotten about my existence and no longer care. Oh, yeah, that happens. So, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I obviously could keep going on away from the ghost into your personal life, and we haven't even talked about your taxidermy and, like, the two skeletons <laughs> you have at home and all the stuff that I really love. But, um, but I'm sure people have questions, and so if you have any... Um, we have a microphone down there, and raise your hand. Unless we've answered all your questions today, in which case I'll please, keep going. Please ask questions, or Victoria will start asking about my sex life. <laughs> you can see the videos yourself. <laughs> no, there aren't any. I tried. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, my question, I thought it was very interesting. The talk was very interesting, and I never knew we'd get into the personal aspects. Thank you very much, because I was actually looking at your hands, and I noticed that you didn't have any rings on. So now I know that that doesn't mean anything. But what I wanted to, um, what I wanted to ask you ab about, I thought it was very interesting. I know as an artist, I'm a, I'm a painter and a writer and do some other things. But 
uh, it's difficult to control how people look at your work or engage with your work. And you indicated that you expected people to read your book in a certain order. And your, the reader who, she said she read her Jane Eyre, she just opened it up someplace. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, how, how, do you give instructions about how to read this book? Or, um, or is this just an expectation of yours? First of all, could I just point something out? That that story about Jane Eyre was not written you know, by Audrey, it was written by Amy. So, okay, no, I no, wasn't no. sure. But no, I understood. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that everybody did, because I had okay. to think about it. Yeah. No, the, I mean, the only instruction I'm giving is really by putting the stories in a certain order, but obviously readers do what they want to do. I mean, the stories are in existence completely independently of each other, and a lot of these writers are dead, so they don't care what we do. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just a suggestion. I know a lot of people who love to skip to the ends of things, Especially if they think it's going to be scary. They skip to the end, figure out who's living at the end of the story, and then they start at the beginning because <laughs> they feel better that way. But um, yeah, my, my idea of what order to read things in is, is just a suggestion. The fabulous thing about the book format is that you can kind of dive in wherever you want. Um, and yeah, it's up to you. Thanks. Anybody else? No okay. other questions? Anybody in the There's back? one. Since it is Halloween and the Fearful Symmetry, it talks at the end that you, um, in your, your biography, that you are a tour guide at Highgate in terms of a, a cemetery. Did that come before the book or as a result of the book? And are you still doing that? Yes, I'm still doing it. Um, it came as a result of doing the research for the novel. Um, when I started working on that book in 2002, um, I got in touch with the cemetery and they were not very excited about me having anything to do with them. <laughs> and I sort of begged and pleaded to be at least allowed to come over there and chat with them. And so they grudgingly said, okay. So I went over there and met uh, Jean Pateman who um, is is the model for the character Jessica and at first she was she was not too interested in having me around but I persevered and she eventually decided that I was okay and and that I was allowed to hang around and after about a year of hanging around she said well then make yourself useful and she just sort of sent me off to start guiding um, the only training that I actually got was following other guides around on their tours and taking a lot of notes which probably they probably didn't like that but at any rate, yeah, I've been doing it ever since. I started guiding in 2004, so it's now been wow, 11, 11 years. years of guiding. Yeah, yeah. I, I do it very intermittently, and um, I, I try not to get anybody's hopes up that they would actually ever have me as a guide because I, I do it every couple of months. Hmm. But the other guides are really interesting. I mean, a lot of the other guides have much more knowledge and scholarship than I do. I was just kind of wondering if you ever had any interest in some of our cemeteries here in Chicago, particularly it's Halloween, and taking the tours of them there, if you would ever do it locally. Um, I would love to take tours of, of Chicago cemeteries. I'm certainly not very knowledgeable about them. Um, certainly not enough to, you know. At one point, somebody got in touch with me like, oh, do you want to do a, um, a tour of um, Graceland? And I'm like, well... I'd like to take one. <laughs> but, well, yeah. the CAF does that, including women of influence at Graceland. So, yeah. Let, let me ask you Thank something you. Um, that I meant to ask you before, speaking of cemeteries and all this stuff. If you don't believe in ghosts, which is you know what a lot of people are fearful of, is is there anything from the paranormal world that would frighten you, that you'd be aware of frightening you now? Not oh, if a ghost came and sat on your bed, but. Uh, what frightens you that isn't just, you know, whatever, normal stuff? Anything? Politics? Yeah, well, that, <laughs> no, but that's normal. That's what I mean by normal. Uh, yeah, okay. that's really scary. Yeah. Um, what is frightening? I mean, I think there are certainly things that we don't know about that are outside of our knowledge that are frightening, but... To me, those, those things are like, hey, what's in a black hole? You know, what, what about all those 
bacteria that we don't know about. You know, there's, there's all this stuff that's in the physical world that seems to me rather scary. I mean, lately, because I'm 52 now, all of a sudden, people keep telling me about all these bizarre medical experiences that they're having. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, I had no idea that's the body scary. could even do that. Um, so, uh, How about yeah. aliens? Aliens would certainly be scary, but... But do you, I mean, do you feel better about them than ghosts? Like, there are some, for instance? Well, I mean, in an infinite universe, there must be something, right? We can't be the only sentient beings anywhere at any time. Can People we? would argue with that, but uh, I'm glad to hear that know. you feel like that. Yeah, see, the headline will be, you know, Niffenegger, believes, believes strong in believer aliens, in aliens. Right. <laughs> believes in <laughs> Area 52. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we have another question here. We, we have time for a couple more. Wait, wait, wait. We have to say it into a microphone. Okay. Uh, what books did you love as a child? And if you have time now, um, who do you enjoy reading? Do you read nonfiction or just fiction? Yeah, I read nonfiction. Um, the books that I really loved when I was a kid, I was a huge fan of Harriet the Spy. Um, I think that's, that's a book that launched a lot of writers. I know Donna Tartt is a fan also. Um, yeah, there were loads of books I loved when I was a kid. I mean, lately I've been thinking a lot about those Alfred Hitchcock collections of scary stories for kids. Those were pretty interesting. Um, I, the thing that I used to do when I was a kid, my mom was an English major and had all these books which were in the room that I, my bedroom, you know. And so I would read all these things like Beowulf that made no sense to me whatsoever. And, and, you know, Women in Love by D.H. Lawrence and Thomas Hardy. So I was, I was reading, like, above my punching level <laughs> without comprehension, but it was, it was interesting to try to take on books that were too old for me. Um, but, yeah, I, I, just, I used to go in the library and sort of rove around and pick out stuff with interesting covers. Um, but, yeah, these days, what am I reading right now? I just started Sally Mann's um, autobiography, uh, The Photographer. Um, I've always loved her work, and that book is, she's had an in interesting life. Um, I just started Patti Smith's uh, M Train, which is just as excellent as her first one, Just Kids. So um, I read a lot of comics, because I'm all of a sudden moving in the comics world. But uh, yeah, just, you know, foraging as, as usual. Is there one more question before we, there's one. Is the urge to paint coming back at all? <laughs> um, there's always the urge to paint. The question is always what, t how much time, you know? Um, I remodeled my studio last year, so the whole studio was just this wreck, and now it's all back again, and everything's in place, so I can actually get work done. So, yeah, working on it. Thanks for asking. <laughs> well. Thank you very much, all of you. I hope you've got a lot of candy in store, trick-or-treating. The rain has stopped. And Audrey, it's always a pleasure. We're going back now like almost 20 years, which is nauseating, but wonderful <laughs> that I'm doing it with you. So thank you very much. And also, Amy, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Thank program. you, Victoria. Thank you, everybody.